Espero que todos estejam bem. Estamos aqui hoje, mais uma edição do Teaços. Agradecer a presença da Luciana Ximenes, da nossa querida tradutora Isa, que hoje está hiper ocupada, né, Isa? Acho que bom que você está aqui conosco. E a gente tem a grata alegria de receber hoje Stefano Carpani. Antes de apresentar o Stefano propriamente dito, eu queria, eu queria é, dizer hoje é uma data muito particular para a realidade brasileira. Hoje faz 26 de fevereiro de 2021, faz um ano do anúncio do primeiro caso de Covid no Brasil, identificado. Né? E, e um ano após o anúncio do primeiro caso que foi reconhecido, nós temos um saldo de 251 mil mortos. Apenas os Estados Unidos têm um número de mortos maior do que o nosso país. Nós temos apenas 3% da população vacinada. O país está em pleno colapso, as redes de saúde saturadas, é, e isso tudo a gente não pode esquecer de acreditar ao péssimo gerenciamento do governo, a, ao infortúnio de nós termos um presidente como esse que nos dirige, que ontem, ontem ao anunciarmos 250 mil mortos, ele fez uma live sobre os perigos de se usar as máscaras. Então, é uma situação muito triste, muito desesperançosa às vezes, mas, mas estamos aqui para reagir. Nosso nome é Resistência. Nós vamos superar isso e o Tiaços tem um compromisso ético com essa posição de sobreviver, resistir eroticamente. E esse projeto todo que nós fazemos há mais ou menos desde fevereiro do ano passado, encontra aqui a sua maior, o seu maior sentido. Fazer do Teaços também um lugar de promover forças a favor da vida. Então, vamos adiante e vamos apresentar, então, Stefano Carpani. Stefano, vou te apresentar primeiro formalmente. É... Stefano Carpani é sociólogo italiano, formado em Cambridge e em Manchester, psicanalista formado pelo Instituto C.G. Jung em Zurich e candidato no Departamento de Estudos Psicossociais e Psicanalíticos na Universidade de Essex. Ele também é graduado em Literatura e Filosofia pela Universidade Católica de Milão, Possui a sua clínica particular na cidade de Berlim. Stefano é editor desse excelente livro, Breakfast at Kuznack, que é também uma série de vídeos e entrevistas no seu canal no YouTube. Ele acabou de lançar The Plural Turn in Jungian and Post-Jungian Studies, que acabou de lançar, acho que essa semana está finalmente nas mãos. E o Stefano está editando mais dois novos livros que eu vou pedir depois para que ele possa apresentar para a gente. Stefano, prazer te receber. Já acompanho o teu trabalho há muito tempo pelas entrevistas no teu canal, é, depois pelos teus próprios textos. É, então, o convite para você participar do nosso projeto de teatro sempre, sempre esteve à mente e agora, finalmente, a gente teve a oportunidade de, de poder fazê-lo e ter a alegria de você ter aceito. Sinta-se à vontade, obrigado, a palavra é tua. Thank you, my dear friend. Obrigado. We never met, but I feel we met a long time ago. Uh -huh. Thank you for talking about the death, 250,000 dead people only in Brazil. My country was the first to be affected in the Western world one year ago. Nobody expected that the virus would develop beyond China. 
And perhaps you also saw on TV what was happening in Italy, that the army had to intervene with trucks to bring the coffins from the hospitals to the graveyards. That was a scene that really changed my perception of things and how the situation was. One year ago, I started to remind everyone a sentence that the great German philo uh, sociologist said many years ago about the risk society, said we are all vulnerable, we are all responsible. There is no bullshit about it. We're all vulnerable, we're all responsible. Um, thank you for talking about my two published books. Breakfast at Kuznach was really a journey into the minds and the lives of uh, the analysts I met and I liked and I loved during my training. The second book, which was published last Tuesday, is actually a tribute to one of my masters, perhaps the master with whom I have such a strong link, Andrew Samuels. Many of you know Andrew, many of you love Andrew, or many of you hate Andrew, he's so polarizing, but he's genuine, he gives everything to you. <clears throat> I have the honor to call him friend, uh, and I will refer to his work tonight. Um, the third book will come out in nine months, one year, again for Lout Routledge, is actually two volumes, and is going to be titled The New Ancestors, and I will talk about the new ancestor tonight. Subtitle, um, anthology of, oh, I don't remember the subtitle, <laughs> it's the emotion. Uh, the new ancestor, uh, anthology of contemporary classic, clinically, theoretically in analytical psychology. It will be two volumes, one theoretical, one um, uh, clinical with 30, new masters, new ancestor from Andrew, Verena Kass, John Beebe, um, Zoya, Riedel, Skogeman, uh, Denise Ramos, your Brazilian Denise Ramos. The fourth book is uh, titled Freedom After Freedom, and you will be there, Marcus, right? You will be, you will be there with the paper, and this is a quite unique book because it's not going to be a Jungian book. It's going to be a neo-Jungian book where also non-Jungian are included. We will look at freedom after freedom was given to everyone in the Western world in the 70s, 80s. So with the collapse of the classical society uh, that is driven by gender, religion, institution, work classes. So what is real freedom? And I talk about absolute freedom. Absolute freedom for me is when beyond being individualized, which means be, be free in a second late modern society, also being individuated. Um, tonight, I will do with you an exercise for the introduction of the new ancestors and for a talk that I will give at the European uh, analytical psychology conference that will take place in Berlin next summer, hopefully live, more certainly online. So as Andrew Samuels in 1985 wrote a book, Jung and the Post-Jungians, I can hear something now. Somebody open the mic, yeah, thank you. Um, as Andrew Samuel wrote a book titled Jung and the Post-Jungians, tonight I take the freedom to call this uh, uh, lecture seminar Jung and the Neo-Jungians. <clears throat> Sit back, relax, take a glass of wine or coffee. I will talk for half an hour or a bit more. Who exactly are today's Jungian ancestors? Ask Andrew Samuel when endorsing my book titled Breakfast at Kuznach.
Shall I start a new? Because there was something, something happened on the video. Okay. I think someone clicked where was not supposed to be clicked. Who exactly are today's Jungian ancestors? Ask Andrew Samuels when endorsing my book title, Breakfast at Kuznach. Not really Jung von Franz, Tony Wolf, Neumann, Jacobi, Hillman, Foreman, he answered and continued. Well, of course we all read them, but ancestors change. The analysts who studied under those giants are, if not today's giants, at least already ancestor in their own right. Therefore, I ask myself, who are the new ancestor for my generation of newly certified analysts? Of course, ancestor is a controversial term, and maybe we have to distinguish between mentors and ancestors. I propose that mentors are personal and that the mentor and the mentor mutually attract each other and benefit from the relationship. Without this precondition, there is no mentor-mentor relationship. Take, for example, Plato and Socrates, and Jung and Freud, which was certainly a mentoring relationship while it lasted and became for Jung an ancestral relationship only after Freud's death. Very important. Therefore, ancestors, I propose, are collective and belong to the whole community, family. Aren't we Jungians a family? You cannot choose an ancestor, right? It is there. But when talking about ancestor, we have to be careful. Because if we follow the Cambridge Dictionary, never the Oxford Dictionary, the Cambridge Dictionary, we find that an ancestor is a person related to you who lived a long time ago. I prefer the version from the Collins Dictionary which is anyhow better than the Oxford Dictionary. Your ancestor are the people from whom you descend or you are descended. And there is no doubt that although our daily lives are so different from those of our ancestors, we could trace our ancestor back few hundred years. This is exactly what I'm trying to do with this lecture and with the introduction of my book. Synonymous to these are the concept of forefather, foremother, predecessor, precursor, and forerunner. Someone who was there before you and had an influence on you and who you have become. <clears throat> I propose that the above mentioned ancestor by Samuels are the ancestor of the previous generation. Each generation what he called the post Jungians. The fourth, the question is, who are the ancestors of my generation, of our generation, the new Jungians, and the next generations? Who are the new ancestors? This seminar tries to answer those questions. And hopefully, this will serve as a guideline for those adventuring this field looking for the new ancestor, as well as to serve future generation of Jungians, analysts, scholars, historian, and students. My book, The New Ancestor, also plays a role in expanding current discussion on Jung, the post-Jungians, and contemporary analytical psychology studies, and some of the important issues addressed by it. Furthermore, the book constitutes recognition to the generation of the post unions that shaped analytical psychology in the past 25, 30 years. Another important aspect that helped me to advance and shape the idea of an ontology of contemporary classic in analytical psychology is the fact that despite the many differences, as Verena Kast underlined in the preface to my book, Breakfast at Kuznach, we should reflect deeper on the figure and symbolism of the Jungian analyst, and that if and when doing so, we can, quote Verena Kast, feel and discern a common basic attitude, end quote. I believe there is a truth in what Verena stated. Therefore, this is a common basic there is a common basic attitude as well as an heter heterogeneous one. 
Important is also to underline that Jung should not be taken as a messiah who already said everything there is to say, and that the Jungians are a cult. These would arm our field. Apart from celebrating your ancestor within an analytical psychology, this book and this lecture tonight wishes to bring a finalistic look at the future and ask, what is the task of my generation? Which is the agenda 2050 for analytical psychology? I feel the answer lies in the following five steps. One, for a Jungian psychosocial relational model. Two, culture critic, social critics as much as personal therapist. Three, the neo Jungians. Four, time for extraversion. Five, medicine contra the soul. I will look now at the Jungian psychosocial relational model. Let's look at psychosocial studies and relational psychoanalysis respectively, which have been the model towers which psychoanalysis have moved, adapted in the past few decades and try to link it with our field. Jung and the psychosocial. In my PhD work, employing the pioneering survey of the reach of analytical psychology offered by Progruff in 1955, I showed the first element that makes of Jung a pioneer of psychosocial studies, and thereby the fact that Jung perceived that the human psyche cannot function without a culture, and no individual is possible without society. Moreover, Jung makes it his principle that all analysis must start from the primary fact of the social nature of man. In the development of analytical psychology, Redman, 2014, claimed that is that what can be called Jungian psychosocial studies have an equal concern for the depth and range of social processes that are in play and help constitute the context or phenomenon in question. These imply a concern for phenomena over and above those arising from social interaction to include those belonging to large groups, the social system and structure. On this basis, I would claim that Jung's work is by its very nature psychosocial and vice versa. I claim so since Stefan Frosch in 2014, when underlining which books would be published by Palgrave's studies in the psychosocial, underlines that, quote, books in the series will generally pass beyond their points of origin to generate concepts, understandings and forms of investigation that are distinctly, distinctively psychosocial in character, and that, transdisciplinary objects of knowledge are continually invented in ways that demand the blurring of previous disciplinary boundaries. This is certainly Jung's approach, from medicine to psychiatry to, to occult phenomena, like in the study of his PhD thesis, to alchemy, so beyond the drive theory and Freud, to myth, the collective unconscious, and physics, synchronicity. This is also confirmed by Redman, who underlined that seeking to investigate how social is implicated in the psychological, psychosocial studies necessarily pay close attention to psychosocial and emotional states and view these states as lively and consequential for psychological and social life as well. Furthermore, Frosch underlines that psychosocial studies, quote, draws heavily on psychoanalytic studies, but also on various models of social and political theory. In this attitude, I frame also Jungians such as Progroff, Samuels, Watkins, and also non-Jungians such as Kreib, Orbach, and Leighton. All these authors share a common characteristic of transdisciplinarity. In fact, Frosch developed his theory from the core premises of depth psychology, which he linked to different areas of investigation. 
sometimes giving the impression that his work was about religion or anthropology, ethnology, philosophy, etc., rather than psychology. Interestingly, both contemporary psychosocial studies and Jung's method of cross-disciplinary survey the vote tale with what Freud suggested in 1926. He wrote, a college of psychoanalysis, much would have to be taught in it, which is also taught by the medical faculty. Alongside branches of knowledge which are remote from medicine, such as the history of civilization, mythology, the psychology of religion, the science of literature. I would add that if we add ethnology, anthropology, and alchemy, among other Jung's interests, and take Jung's view that all these apply to analytical psychology, we describe the usual curriculum of the Carl Gustav Jung Institute in Zurich since 1948. Now let's look at Jung and relational psychoanalysis. As Lou Aaron noted, relational psychoanalysis emerged in the context of early 1980s American psychoanalysis and now, quotes, operates as a shared subculture that has stuck deep common shorts among current clinical practitioners and theorists. Relational psychoanalysis developed thanks to the pioneering effort of psychoanalyst Stephen Mitchell, who died too young, age 85, sorry, 55. Stephen Mitchell, supported by Robert Sto Stolarov, Jay Grimble, and Aaron himself. The contributing factors to its development were, A, the influence of the interpersonal psychoanalysis of Harry Stack Sullivan, Eric Fromm and Clara Thompson from the 30s and 40s. B, object relation theory and the works of Fairbairn, Winnicott and Bowlby from the 70s. C, cohort self-psychology of the late 70s. D, American psychoanalytic feminism and feminist psychoanalysis, including the work of Jessica Benjamin and social criticism of the late 70s and early 80s. It was in this landscape that, as Aaron noted, Greenberg and Mitchell coined the term relational in 1983 to bridge the various strands of psychoanalysis current at that time, which included interpersonal relation, object relation, self-psychology, social constructivism, psychoanalytic hermeneutics, and gender theorizing. From this standpoint, bring Greenberg and Mitchell work on a model that would, one, provide an, alter an alternative understanding to classical drive theory. Two, generate new understanding of precisely the phenomena that drive theorists have traditionally regarded as fundamental. The body, sexuality, pleasure, aggression, constructionality, the patient free association. Three, argue that mind occurs in me, you, patterns, see Sullivan, and that the analyst is merely a participant observer embedded in the transference counter transference matrix. Four, build on Winnicott's statement that there is no such a thing as an infant, only the infant mother unit. Five, emphasize the emergence of what Odgen calls the intersubjective analytic third when speaking of two-person psychology. Del Lowenthal in 2014 highlighted, quote, the widespread realization that the therapy relationship runs in both direction is mutual and involves the whole person of the practitioner, end of quote. Adding that the relational is most apparent in Freud, Klein, and object relation theories, as well as Jung. Thus, he, De Lowenthal, reminds us that of the mounting research evidence that the analytic relationship is a crucial factor in successful psychological therapy. 
And in asking why this is the case, he refers to Argaden and Schwartz describing of relational psychoanalysis. Emphasize the centrality of the relationship. Emphasize that therapy involves a bidirectional process. Emphasize that therapy involves both the vulnerability of the therapist and the patient. I really hate the word client. Patient from pathos, from emotions. Emphasize the use of counter transference in thoughtful disclosure and collaborative dialogue. Emphasize the co-construction and multiplicity of meaning. As noted by my dear mentor and friend Andrew Samuel in 2012, where Bo unpublished, Jung asserted that since analysis was dialectical, invoke mutual transformation through the therapeutic relationship. Its methods was necessarily dialogic and would have to include the emotionally charged interaction between therapist and patient. Samuels also notes that analysis, according to Jung, is quote, an encounter between two psychic holes in which knowledge is used only as a tool. Therefore, with Sullivan's idea, quote, that mind always emerges and develops contextually in the interpersonal field. And with Greenberg and Mitchell's assertion that, quote, there is no such a thing as either the patient or the analyst, only the patient analyst unit. Additional reason why Jung should be considered a relational ante literum, point one and two, is that Jung, together with Adler, Alfred Adler, realized the need to move beyond Freud's drive theory and sought an alternative in which Freud's drive theory and sexuality, Adler's inferiority and compensation in Jung's symbolic life and spirituality could coexist. Such an approach would, as Arons underlines, examine issues of sex and gender, which in drive theory, with its fixated or fixed attitudes towards sexuality and aggression, are obscures with regard to how they take in meaning of the relational context. I think most of the analysis represented by essays in those two volumes, my volume of the new ancestor, would agree on this view. I should mention here that on my own Jungian relational psychosocial model is based on the following nine pillars. One, it, it connects theory and clinical work, therefore helping to prove the accuracy and the efficacy of analytical work with patients. Two, it is transdisciplinary. Three, it is pluralistic, as underlined by Andrew Samuels, and demonstrates an attitude of inclusion to replace the split and separation typical of the history of psychoanalysis. Four, it starts, as Susie Orbach underlined in 2014, it starts from the premise that the individual is born into a set of social and psychological circumstances. Five, as Frosch underlined in 2014, it investigates the ways in which psychic and social processes demand to be understood as always implicated in each other. Six, again, with Frosch, it has an emphasis on affect, the irrational and unconscious processes often but not necessarily understood psychoanalytically. And this is amazing, amazing. Not necessarily understood psychoanalytically. Don't we all often analyze everything only psychoanalytically? This is a reminder that we are also humans. Seven, it offers a conflict relational approach, following Gorbach, and stress the need for continuous adaptation in the process of becoming who people authentically are. Who am I? What do I want? the two basic questions of psychoanalysis. Eight, becoming who people authentically are is seen as liberation, following Mary Watkins. Nine, analysis is framed as accompaniment, to accompany someone from here to there. 
to share a piece of the journey, a part of the journey. Analysis is framed as a companion based on the co-construction and multiplicity of meaning. All of these points are developed in pioneering form in the essay included in my book. They contextualize the agenda 2050 for a Jungian relational psychosocial model that knows how not to disturb the deep process of individuation, which is the task of my generation to continue to protect our generation. Following the guidelines laid down by our newest ancestors. Now let's look at Kulturkritik. Kulturkritik is a German term. Jung was a Kulturkritiker, social critic as much as personal therapist. Samuel suggests that within both the microcosm of an individual and the macrocosm of the global village, quote, we are floated by psychological themes and that politics embodies the psyche of a people, end quote. Thus, it reminds us that, quote, the founder of psychoanalysis felt themselves to be social critics as much as personal therapists, Samuels 2001. And in this respect, recalls Freud, Jung, Maslow, Rogers, Pearls, the Frankfurt School, Reich, and Fromm. He also notes that in the 90s, psychoanalysts such as Orbach, Kulkarni, and Frosch began to consider society once more, but notes that although, quote, the project of linking therapy and the world is clearly not a new one, very little progress seems to have been made, end of quote. Thus, <clears throat> he stresses that today, quote, more therapists than ever want psychotherapy to realize the social and political potential that its founders perceived in it, end of quote, but is aware of the large gap between wish and actuality. I argue that my own Jungian relational psychosocial model might fill this gap. In contrast to Hillman, James Hillman, Samuels actively demonstrate how useful and effective perspective derived from psychotherapy might be in the formation of policy, in new ways of thinking about the political process and in the resolution of conflicts, and claimed that, quote, our inner world and our private lives reel from the impact of policy decision and the existing political culture. Look at the comments by Marcus before. Isn't this the case of COVID? Inner and outer, beyond ignorance and fear, vulnerability and responsibility. In considering why policy committees do not include psychotherapists, Samuels notes that, quote, you would expect to find therapists having views to offer on social issues that involve personal reactions. This is Samuels' most innovative aspect to see psychoanalysts, as well as individuals, as activists with a fundamental role to play within society. I propose that we should work both within and outside of the consulting room, as we are doing now, although I suppose we are mainly Jungians and psychoanalysts and therapists, we should really get the fuck out of the consulting room. Isa, did you translate me correctly? Get the fuck out of the consulting room. Not to go to the beach because it's the best season in Brazil, but to work. Propose that we should work both within and outside of the consulting room as a successful consultant for politicians, organizations, activist groups, etc., etc., and also to regain the quid. We inherited, although didn't enact, of the founder of psychoanalysis, social critics and personal therapist. Tiasos is this. Becoming again and a new culture critic. We might be able to continue to play or to play a new a role 
in the development of 21st century societies. Finally, we get to the neo jungians The neo jungians are the third generation of Jungians, being the first generation between 1961, when Jung died, and 1985, called either the Zurich School, the Classical School by Samuel, I like to call them the Orthodox Jungians, and the second generation between 85 and 2011, when Hillman died, called by Andrew the Post Jungians. The Neo Jungians is a term I coined recently, employ Jung in a new fashion, along with other schools and tradition of psychoanalysis and beyond psychoanalysis, as the relational school suggests, which mutually contaminate and enrich each other. The neo Jungians encompassing eclecticism and integration aims to restore and enhance Jung's work Analytical and analytical psychology at the core of depth psych psychology by studying the psyche as plural. This new approach is constituted by a heterogeneous international and multicultural group of scholars who on the one hand base their work on the teachings of Jung, of course, the post-Jungians, of course, while on the other end, have opened their investigation beyond analytical psychology, beyond analytical psychology. I conducted my training at the Carl Gustav Jung Institute in parallel with my PhD. At the Carl Gustav Jung Institute in Zurich, I learned about Jung and the, po the post-Jungians. During my PhD, I went beyond the Jungians. Susie Orpak, Lynn Layton, Jessica Benjamin, Frosch, Craig, Freud, Freud, Freud. We are all Freudians with distinctions, but we are all Freudians. Therefore, the neo Jungians are able to balance the teaching of Jung and the post Jungians with those teachings coming from other schools and tradition, both within and beyond psychoanalysis, in a mutual and plural and reaching exchange. In fact, contemporary neo-Jungians can be linked, although not limited, to relational and post-relational psychoanalysis, feminist psychoanalysis, the intersubjective approach, psychosocial studies, and cultural studies, to name a few. The neo-Jungians look, look at psychoanalysis as follows. One, it took I will not read this because it's the same as before. It's the same point I read before for my approach. So the task of the neo Jungians is to look at the future and the first thing to do is to honor and preserve the work. The first and second generation of Jungians made. The neo Jungians find in the aforementioned Jungian psychosocial relational model their frame of reference, thus, there are many ways to be a Jungian or to be a Jungian. And this is very good news. It signifies that analytical psychology is alive and reflects the continuing interest in, as well as perhaps even rejuvenation of Jung's theory at the beginning of the 21st century. Now I would like to look at extroversion and introversion. Extroversion is not superficial. Jungians mainly stress introversion in their clinical writings. And this has not always been helpful outside our circles. We are so comfortable within our introverted circles, in my praxis, in my library, in my room, with my books, with my one-to-one -one patient, maximum with a couple. I hope that in the next 30 years, some of us, the most extroverted one perhaps, will be able to influence society as culture critic outside our usual circles, presenting our work at non-Jungian and non-psychoanalytical conferences, even more, 
Talking about our approach with pride, courage, and without inferiority. At different media outlets, get out. Speak to TVs, speak to radios, speak to newspapers, policy makers, an institution of different sorts. We have a lot to say. Our method works. Becoming extroverted would be the most innovative aspect. Therefore, following Samuels, who is pretty much extroverted, would mean to see psychoanalysts as well as individuals as activists with a fundamental role to play within society. Talking about politics in the consultant room was taboo, was forbidden. Haven't we all with our patient talked about politics and COVID in the last 12 months? How do you feel about that? What was the outcome of that conversation? If taken seriously and respectfully, it helps the conversation. We don't have to agree on politics, but politics is all around us. Marcus' opening statement was a political statement. I'm reaching the end of my reading. And I would like to look at two very important aspects for our profession. Medicine contra the soul. Another point which is of fundamental importance is about training analysis and who and how is to be admitted to train within Jungian's Institute around the world. Hillman in 2011, in this book, Suicide and the Soul, Suicide and the Soul, underlines that, quote, it is up to each individual involved in the analysis to defend their own experience, the symptoms, the suffering, the neurosis, and also the invisible positive results, in front of a word that gives no credit to these things. Powerful. And he continues, quote, the soul can return to being a reality only if it has the courage to take it as the reality before its life, to take sides with it, with it instead of just believing in its existence, end of quote. On this regard, as word in favor of the model carried the cargoes of Yumisit in Zurich, where as tradition, non-medical doctors, myself, Known psychologist myself can participate in the training. I am convinced that this approach is the best because it was the original approach before politics stepped in, before the mental health stepped in and decided that only medical doctors and psychologists should do therapy. Well, we don't do therapy actually, we do something else, and I will get to it now. I'm convinced that this approach is the best and that it must be implemented globally. Globally. It follows that the title of doctor, medical doctor, and psychologist is removed as a criterion for admission. This is because the approach of medicine and psychology, as Illman suggests, has nothing to do, nothing to do with the work of the soul with working with the soul. While the analysis aims to facilitate the flow and to reconnect the symbolic fragment, fragments in a mythic, mythical configuration. In a mythical configuration, Hillman. And it is no coincidence that among the best, the best analysts are known medical doctors or known psychologists. Ingrid Riedel, Andrew Samuels, Luigi Zoya. You want me to continue? Mine, like Illman's, is a campaign in favor of analysis as, quote from Hillman, modern medicine imposes a split between doctor and his soul. 
And as it is fundamental that the practice of psychotherapy must leave the medical background behind to proceed independently. Already Freud in 1926 wrote on the subject. Freud intervened on the fence of Theodor Reich, Austrian psychoanalyst and collaborator of the same, who in 1924 was accused of abusing the medical profession as he practiced psychoanalysis, having a degree in philosophy, like me, and helped to exonerate him by defending the legitimacy of the use of psychoanalysis also by known doctors. Freud, in a letter addressed to Julius Tandler, influential anatomist and Viennese politician, underlined the legitimacy of the profession by Rake. In that, quoting by Freud, psychoanalysis, whether it is considered a science or a technique, it is not a purely matter medical. And secondly, it is not taught to medical students at university. Hillman underlines, quote, Freud soon realized that it was necessary to partially abandon medicine because the analyst does not physically examine his patient, does not prescribe a medicine for organic disorder, he refers it or them to others. In the analyst office, there is no medical devices. You don't see white coats and black briefcase. Then Hillman points out that, quote, Freud fears have come true. Freudian analysis has become the handmaid of psychiatry, end of quote. And that, quote, Freudian therapy becomes acceptable by medicine, end of quote, as a natural science. In fact, most of these psychiatrists and psychology has not been analyzed. In fact, most of these psychiatrists and psychologists have not been analyzed. They have never been in training analysis. So, I propose that the degree in medicine or psychology are not the prerogative to access psychoanalytical training, but that the criteria enforced at the Carl Gustav Jung Institute in Zurich should be adopted. One, to write candidates to write a 10 page autobiography as transparent as possible, as true as possible. Two, once admitted to interviews, go through six interviews with accredited analyst. Once admitted to the training, going through at least 300 hours of training analysis, parallel during the second half of the training, by 300 hours of individual and group supervision. And very important, as an antidromia, having clinical cases, clinical hours, and internship in psychiatric institution with good psychiatric teachers as an antidromia. In conclusion, following Andrew Samuel's proposal at the fourth analysis and activism activism conference held in San Francisco in October 2020, I agree that training to be truly egalitarian should not require a master degree, not even a bachelor degree. Candidates should be interviewed anonymously and accepted on the basis of the fulfillment of the above mentioned requirements. and their willingness to train, which means learning the theoretical aspect of this profession and to undergo self-analysis to become a Jungian psychoanalyst. Thank you very much. Obrigado, Stefano. Ótimas, ótimas questões para a gente discutir, para a gente poder pensar junto. Vamos abrir é, para as perguntas, sempre obedecendo ao nosso método de que coloque o nome no chat, eu chamo e a pessoa faz a pergunta. 
Stefano, vou começar com duas questões para você. É... Yeah. É... 25 anos depois do Jungs pós-Jungianos, do Samuels, a expressão pós-Jungiano ainda causa em algum, em alguma, em algum nível da, da comunidade Jungiana uma espécie de preconceito, causa uma espécie de rejeição e recusa. Esse é um sentimento que me parece ainda vivo, particularmente na fantasia de que o prefixo pós indique uma, uma superação ou uma declaração de anacronismo das ideias de Jung, que me parece que é uma, uma interpretação equivocada, errônea. É... Você acha que a expressão neo-junguianos é... pode ser uma tentativa, vai cair, vai ser alvo desse mesmo preconceito? Uma primeira questão que eu gostaria de colocar para você. Faço, posso fazer uma segunda pergunta direta ou, ou você responde essa? Uh, maybe I, I try to answer. You know what? I don't, my answer is I don't care. <laughs> let people speak, let people debate about it. And it's not arrogance. I'm trying to propose something, something that I experienced during my training throughout my global contacts. I love to speak to so many ancestors, to so many senior analysts. And if people want to debate about neo, post, upper, whatever, it's fine. What is important is that we talk about what is analytical psychology right now and what we want analytical psychology to be in 2050. We need to have an agenda. And our generation, me, Marcus, Luciana, we are the next generation. We have a duty. We have a duty. So the post, neo, bio, eco, oco is not interesting. Ok, ok. Segunda questão. É... Movimentos junguianos e a política, e a política contemporânea. Nós, junguianos, temos uma caixa de ferramentas úteis para poder lidar com a política contemporânea? A nossa caixa de ferramentas teóricas para poder interpretar, ler, intervir, agir, pensar, ela ainda é uma caixa de ferramentas úteis ou nós precisamos ter mais instrumentos junto conosco? Well, you know, if we take an example or metaphor from technology, technology develops, you know? So if you, in the 1920s, you had an excavator, now you would have a more modern ex excavator. But this is the history, the literature, psychoanalytical literature and beyond psychoanalytical literature of the past 100 years, neuroscience, advance in philosophy, in history studies, in mathematics, yeah? The tools we have are good enough. But sometimes, as Jung said, if I have a patient with a sexual problem, I will use Freudian theory. If I have a patient with an inferiority complex, I will use Adlerian theory. If I see that the patient has a spiritual problem, I will use my own theory. We have to become adaptable. That's why I like to say we are all Freudians with distinctions, because we are. The more we know, the more tools we will be able to employ, but our are strong enough, are good enough. Look at politics. We can easily and actually in a very positive way apply Jung's uh, psychodynamics, 
shadow, the anima, the animus, the self, the CG. Yeah? Umberto Eco, one of the most important semiotics researcher and writers, uh, said, those that read no books only live their life. Those that read books live as many lives as, as the books they read. So let's use our tools, our literature, and be open. Be open, creative, flexible, not one-sided. That's why I think that psychosocial studies and relational psychoanalysis is very interesting. It's not the final step, but for now is a useful additional tool to what we have. And to be a Jungian is something special because you cannot become a Jungian if you don't feel it. It's not like to become a psychiatrist and then maybe a Freudian, which is the common way. To be a Jungian is somehow a vocation. Now it seems a bit inflated, megalomanic, but to be a Jungian is somehow a vocation. And the majority of Jungians have a huge mother complex, as Jung had. At least as in Zurich. I don't know you in Brazil. Tá ótimo. É, vamos abrir para as perguntas. Gustavo Beck, começa com você, por favor. Gustavo. Aí? I am, Marcus. How are you? Good to see you. Hi, Stefano. Ciao, Gustavo. Thanks for Ciao, your Stefano. Uh, like or post on Facebook yesterday. <laughs> well, I was excited to see the book. Congratulations. Thank Congratulations. Thank you, my dear. Uh, and um, I, I have a question that kind of tortures me. And I, I've, I've talked about this with Marcus and with several people in this room, actually. Because when you say this thing about sort of us having to have an agenda, no? And, and sort of, I, th I think that excites me, no? I say, yes, let's have an agenda. But I think that, and I don't know I'm if I'm I'm afraid of your question now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> I don't know if you know, but I'm, I, right now I'm training in Chicago to be an analyst. Mm -hmm. And my, my, mo my most dense torture in the training are the, the cultural and social differences. So for me, one, one of the issues institutionally in the union world is that we use the word we, but that we is not a real we. Mm. So for example, like when I come here to Brazil, I feel an a very different vibe or a very different atmosphere from when I attend uh, I don't know, something in Chicago or from a European. And, and, and it is palpable and it has to do with oppression, with difference in class, with, with economic differences. So how do you implement an agenda when there are such sort of marked differences in the members of the community, which I feel are unacknowledged? I agree. I was afraid because uh, I thought you were going to say, how can you implement an agenda if you're a Jungian? Well, that's true. <laughs> that's, that's true as well. And that's true, but you know, the diamond, our own diamond is an agenda itself. So perhaps analytical psychology is as an agenda which is unconscious itself. And it's the development of the self of analytical psychology, which is unknown to the individuals, but is maybe unconsciously unknown to the collective. Having said this, let me give you an example. I'm Italian. I live in Berlin, where I conducted my training analysis and I studied in Zurich. Zurich. I, someone again, connected, I think. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. No, oh, okay. Um, I remember it was summer or autumn 2015 when in Europe there was the big refugee welcome crisis, Syrians marching through Greece, former Yugoslavia, Budapest, Hungary, Austria, Vienna, and then up to Germany. I was going to one of my first sessions 
uh, with Dr. Langvilla, with the late Dr. Langvilla. And I was in the underground station. And a woman with a baby came into the wagon begging for money. No one gave her a cent and even looked her with strange eye. And I was like, what's going on? The Berliners are not like this, you see. She was obviously from uh, not Germany. Possibly she was Syrian. A very decent woman who was asking for money in English. Good evening, my name is, could you please give me some money? I was touched by it, really touched. You know, the comment of Jungians in Zurich have a huge mother complex. At the next stop, this woman leaves the wagon and a junkie that was for sure high, beg for money, selling newspaper as usual in Berlin, he got fucking money. I went to my analyst and I was really, really pissed off. And I told the story and he looked at me and this is the cultural complexes or the cultural differences. And he said, well, you see in Germany, if you need money, you don't need to beg. You can go to the appropriate institutions and get help. For me as an Italian, this was impossible because in Italy, if you need money, where do you go? You beg, yeah? But he was telling me this is Germany and there are other ways. I now know that. So I can understand you in Chicago training. It's a putpuri, but isn't this also a richness? Isn't this the way it could really be enriching for us. Um, I think that the Jung Institute in Zurich, originally as it was set, is the only truly international institute in the world. People from everywhere go to Zurich to train. And this is very important. Then we go back home. We bring home a little bit of Zurich, a little bit of that uh, awkward Harry Potter magic. And then we meet at conferences. It was right what Verena said in the preface of my book, Breakfast at Kuznach, that there is a corpus of the Jungian analyst. And then there are so many differences. There are guys that are more orthodox. There are guys that are more archetypal. The, the Berliners are famous to be more Kleinians and they're called Klungians from Klein and Jung. Agenda 25 is also provocation is not for me an agenda to run for president of the International Association in 10, 20 years, because I'm not good at that stuff. But I find that we are a precious institution, that society can benefit from us. If we are courageous enough to get out of the fucking consulting room. So good luck in in Chicago, you're in good hands with George. Yeah, let me let me just give a quick follow up to because I think also to make it more psychological, the the let's say the feeling that I end up usually coming as bumping into is despair. Like mm -hmm. there is there is a feeling of despair that there is something intrinsic in the community that fights against the community. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. isn't this in our blood, in our DNA? Yeah. This is the Freudian aspect, but also Jung's father complex, the authority complex. Hmm? An example, you know, I'm one of the founders of Psychosocial Wednesdays with uh, Paul Ataniello and uh, Bernard Goretzky. Every month we have one book launch and one speaker about whatever topic. We love each other. We were about to break up five times in six months. We are Jungians. We, Luigi Zoya, who I like so much, in the poetical biography to the new ancestor, he wrote something beautiful, said, you know, I love this profession because I'm not good with people. I'm good one-to-one. -one. That's why, he says, perhaps I chose this profession. But our field is so heterogeneous. I understand your despair. You know, 
And sometimes our colleagues in training or our colleague are, but listen, we have to accept this in the plural way. Keep on with your despair. AC left us. He or she didn't like despair. <laughs> yeah, the only, that's the only thing I have left. Obrigado, Gustavo. Grande abraço. É, vamos, pessoal, várias perguntas. Vou pedir para que as pessoas sejam sucintas para dar tempo de todo mundo falar, tá? É, não está em ordem aqui não, mas eu vou chamar as pessoas. Vamos lá, Cris Viana, por favor. Come on, you're Brazilian. We can go over the time. We have all the night and the afternoon, no? <laughs> Or do you have to go to the beach? <laughs> A praia está fechada. <risos> Só da janela. <risos> ah. Vamos lá, Cris. Cris Viana, está aí, Cris? Tô. boa noite. Estão me ouvindo? Estamos. Boa noite, muito é. obrigada. Adorei tudo que eu ouvi. Aqui, infelizmente, cheguei atrasada. Não ouvi a fala do Marcos. Eu já vi que foi bem importante. Espero que fique gravado para poder recuperar depois. É, Stefano, porque eu venho de um outro lugar. Eu venho desse lugar para onde você quer levar as pessoas, ou está tentando levar as pessoas. Eu venho justamente da militância, das organizações sociais, da burocracia e do jornalismo. E tendo convivido com tantos diferentes espaços, é, tanto já tendo pisado no lugar mais pobre do mundo, né, numa favela onde não tem água, onde não tem luz... Né? e também né, na burocracia, falando chegando muito próximo de governadores, enfim, de legisladores, né? a gente vê essa grande diversidade que é preciso né, enxergar para ler o mundo. E nessa agenda 2050, você fala disso, de pluralidade, de inclusão. Só que, para ter essa formação enquanto analista, é uma formação que para países né, do antigo chamado terceiro mundo, ou de países em desenvolvimento, ou países mais pobres, é uma coisa muito cara. Eu não sei se você olhou aqui as carinhas, elas não são representativas desse país, né? Não estão informando as nossas diferenças, né? A questão aqui de a classe informando, né? A raça, a raça informando a classe, né? Então, tem uma questão aqui que é muito visível. Então, como cumprir essa agenda 2050 de inclusão e de diversidade com esses custos tão grandes. Thank you. This is what I tried to um, actually say at the end of medicine and the soul. Yeah, where part from not the need to be a medical doctor, not to be the need to be a psychologist, which is understandable because the states by law require this. In fact, I cannot myself a psychoanalyst, I cannot call myself a psychoanalyst when I work, I'm a counselor and this is legal. If I would say I'm a psychoanalyst, it I would be illegal. Yeah, and I would undergo what Rake went to in Austria in, 20, in, in 1924. But I said, beyond medical doctor, beyond psychologist, Institutes should not require a master degree and should not require a bachelor degree. This means that already we lower not the quality of the candidates, but the requirement, because we know that in many countries, only a certain percentage of the highly educated, maybe wealthy population can get to university, to a post-grade, title and then to a training which is very expensive. Also the Jungian training are very expensive but there are countries where the training are not expensive, are less expensive. But the first step for us for inclusion that is truly beyond the white Christian or Jewish people is to accept analysts or candidates on their basis and their willingness to train. Another example is 
I don't believe, as some Freudian used to claim that Freud claimed, that money is the only mean for successful analysis. No. The wish, the commitment, the bond between the analyst and, and the analysis might help toward a good analysis. So I truly believe that we have to accept candidates not on the current basis because there might be so many candidates that are much better than us, but don't have the means. Maybe we should also find a program of scholarships. I wish one day to, to have good enough money to create a scholarship programs to pay the full training. But then you incur into another problem that is traditionally, you have to pay for your own training because it's part of the suffering. I had nightmares for three years that had debts and I didn't know who the debts were, who to who, yeah? Because at the end of the month, I had very little money in my bank account. But the wish, the vocation, the commitment, was too strong. There is a lot to do and the institution for now are a bit stuck. Andrew was really clear at the end of the analysis and activism conference in San Francisco. We need to change the approach to accept candidates. In Africa, there are almost no analysts. Back to you. Marco, posso, posso só fazer uma, claro, dar uma informação claro, para ele? Claro. Que com o salário mínimo brasileiro você não paga sequer uma sessão semanal para 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 cumprir as 300 horas yeah, da formação. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, you also, you, but you see, uh, on that side, I like to follow what Karl Habram did in Berlin in the 20s. You know, the Berlin Polyclinic was called, in West Berlin, um, for me, it was really innovative. He opened this polyclinic and he had many, many uh, practitioners, including Melanie Klein, who was analyzed by Abram until he died. But he decided that the polyclinic had, let's say, 20 analysts, they all had to have certain amount of clients and do two things. Either have one, two, three session free of charge per week or pay the money for these free sessions. I decided for myself and I tell you something personal. My mom suffered of bipolarity since she was very young. She didn't have the money to pay the fucking analyst. And this affected my family. That's why I'm an analyst today. And that's why I have a range of prices. That's why sometimes I cannot do it with many because I have to pay my things. I don't charge. I have a young man I don't charge. There is a woman I charge very little. So, we have to look into ourselves and decide what we want to do. Of course, we have our expenses, our praxis, our training is very expensive, but to be activist, an analyst and an activist is also to go in a direction that is good for you. And you know, actually these two analyses, the free of charge and the very little charge are two of the best currently because the commitment is so strong. Obrigado, Cris. Obrigado. É, Wagner, está aí, Wagner? Estou aqui, Marcos, tudo bom? Bem? Estou aqui, estou aqui. É, professor é, Stefano, é um prazer é, conhecê-lo. 
E eu vou me reportar, né? Don't call me professor, I'm no professor. Ah. <risos> ok. É, então, é, eu vou me reportar à, à pergunta inicial do Marcos, que tem a ver com a minha inquietação à medida que você foi fazendo a sua explanação. É, quando eu me deparei com mais um termo, né, pós, neo, ou seja, mais um, né, é, mais uma definição, mais um enquadre, né, mais uma possibilidade de criar, sei lá, mais um gueto entre indianos, não sei, estou sendo um pouco pessimista com esta definição. Então, a inquietação que me vem à mente é justamente a atitude do terapeuta, do psicólogo, do psicanalista, com relação à psique. Né? Porque Jung ele fala claramente, nas suas obras completas, né, que considerar a psique significa considerar o seu lado arcaico, ou seja, de neo não tem nada. Né? arcaico, aquilo que representa a base, aquilo que representa a história, né? que representa as formas de ser e de existir do homem ao longo do seu processo evolutivo. Então, o termo neo, serei bem honesto com você, me causou um certo desconforto por conta dessa explanação. Então, qual é a minha pergunta? Como é que você enxerga essa possibilidade de fugirmos ou até deixarmos perdido em algum lugar esse fundamento da psicologia analítica, que é justamente o de se relacionar com o arcaico, né? com o antigo, com o defasado, com aquilo que está longe. Né? Eu acho isso preocupante, porque é claro que é importante a gente estar aqui se relacionando com as coisas, com as premissas do dia a dia e do mundo. Mas será que, lá pelas tantas, não será, na prática, mais uma possibilidade de renúncia ao arcaico e considerarmos sempre modernos à custa da psique? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I'm a sociologist by training. And actually, sociology or certain sociologists say that we are in a continuous modernity. Then someone like Lyotard used the ter term postmodern, which I really dislike. Because sociologists like Beck, Gidden say there is nothing post. Because to have a post, you have to have a break. And maybe Andrew with the post said post Jung. After Jung death. Posthumus of Jung. I take your inspirational comment. I'm not proposing to go away from Jung. I said that we are trained as Jungians and should be training Jung as good as possible. Only that, only after, we can add on other layers, like you are Brazilian, you grew up in Brazil, you were taught Portuguese. And then maybe later you also were taught other languages by your mother tongue will always be your mother tongue. Our mother tongue is analytical psychology. But to be blindfolded, like in BDSM sex, somebody likes it, somebody doesn't like it, you know? So we have to open up. Also, once upon a time there was classicism. And then somebody started with neoclassicism. That's where I got inspiration for the neo Jungians. The roots are there, but there is a new way to look at Jung that is plural and integrative. Are we still friends? Sim. É, mas, assim, o, o ponto que... Eu, eu entendi o que você falou, mas, assim, o meu, claro que é importante essa abertura. Claro que é importante né, nós dialogarmos com aquilo, com aquilo que se apresenta como 
é uma demanda do mundo contemporâneo? Sim. Em um momento, eu questionei isso. Né? A minha, a minha, o meu desconforto né, talvez seja o de como né, os chamados neo-junguianos né, se relacionarão com a psíquica. De que forma essa relação se estabeleceria? Nós vamos ficar de costas para o arcaísmo do homem para apenas o que não deixa de ser uma unilateralidade de qualquer forma, só olhar para frente, olhar para aquilo que está próximo. O atrás não é simplesmente é, um saudosismo, uma nostalgia, mas é considerar a base histórica do homem que fundamenta a psique, pelo menos até onde eu entendo, e um se colocou desse, dessa forma. Né? Então, é esse que é o meu ponto fundamental. Olhar para frente, sim. Olhar o que está próximo, sim. Mas, como ficar com as bases arcaicas da psique? Que elas continuam vigindo. Elas não ficaram para trás pelo fato de eu chamar o né, um novo grupo, a nova possibilidade de neo. Elas continuam existindo. Elas continuam atuando sobre o homem. Então, é essa a minha preocupação maior de que maneira os neo-junguianos se relacionarão com a psique doravante a partir deste conceito. Obrigado. I don't know, because I'm not the head of this new movement. I'm not the president of the new Jungians Jungians. Perhaps I put my sociologist shirt and I realize that there are many Jungians that have a new neo approach. That's it. So, inshallah. Obrigado, Wagner. Luciana Ximenes, vamos? É, Stefano, adorei a tua exposição, adorei, fui ficando super entusiasmada e acompanhada enquanto eu estava te escutando. É, eu queria te é, contar uma experiência que eu tive num coletivo, a Estese, é um coletivo que eu participo e que traz temas é, contemporâneos, a gente sempre convida uma pessoa que não é da área psi e um psicólogo para falar de algum tema, né? E eu gostaria de contar uma experiência que eu tive, é, e daí, se você puder comentar, seria legal, depois eu já vou emendar uma pergunta que eu tenho. A experiência foi a seguinte, é, numa determinada roda de conversa que a gente tinha planejado, eu não me lembro exatamente se era suicídio ou luto, nós fizemos essas duas rodas, é, uma pessoa, ao fazer a inscrição, me perguntou, mas vai ser uma roda psicológica ou uma roda política? E a minha resposta foi, mas dá para falar de qualquer coisa sem ser é, tirando a política? Eu acho que foi uma resposta horrorosa, porque a pessoa sumiu, nunca mais me respondeu, nunca mais se inscreveu em roda nenhuma. Né? Então, é, essa é a história que eu queria que você comentasse. A pergunta que eu tenho, que eu já vou emendar para a gente não perder muito tempo, é a seguinte. É, queria voltar para aquilo que você falou, é, da gente trazer temas contemporâneos, que não tem como a gente não trazer temas contemporâneos para as nossas sessões de análise. A pandemia, as eleições, essas coisas são ditas, né? E é óbvio que a gente não tem que colocar a nossa opinião pessoal, mas a gente precisa falar sobre esses assuntos. O que eu tenho como questão de fundo é... é... O primeiro que eu acho muito difícil, né? Quando a gente se encontra com uma pessoa muito oposta a gente, um negacionista da pandemia, por exemplo, não transparecer que a gente discorda, né? É, e aí a minha questão é como é que a gente é, é, conseguiria lidar com isso sem abusar da transferência, né? Meio naquela linha do abuso de poder na psicoterapia. É, é meio por aí minha pergunta. Hmm. I believe that if the transference and the counter transference is strong enough, if the basis of the relation is secure enough, almost anything can be said and discussed and, and worked on, like between a couple. If the couple is strong enough, you can say everything. If the couple is not strong enough, it's gonna be difficult. 
I had a patient, perhaps the most successful case I had, also thanks to the help of supervision with Wolfgang Gigerich, a woman that came to me five years ago. She said, I feel empty, lost, and relationship don't last. Little by little, we saw that she didn't only have a negative father complex. There was the patriarch, the asshole, blah, 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 but also a negative mother complex. And this was somehow projected or sublimated even in uh, feminism. So I one day proposed to talk about the feminist complex and, <gasps> but the basis of our relationship was strong. Three months ago, that analysis ended and I'm so happy of the development that this woman had. Now the male that she saw as patriarchal is able to approach them in a totally different way, to engage in a conversation. What this person did with you is to ask a question and then cut the conversation. You said, come and let's see. Let's dance valzer with our patients. Tango is a little bit too much. Freudian, let, let, let's, the Freudian, let dance tango. Let's dance, actually a Freudian suggested me this, talking about daughters, talking about my daughters. Fathers have to learn to dance valz with their daughters, not tango. Tango is for the mother or the partners, yeah? So perhaps we can use these for our patient. Let's learn to dance waltz. Malu left us. She doesn't like waltz. <laughs> Valeu, Lu. Obrigado. Ma Martinha, tá aí, Martinha? Oi, estou sim. Está me ouvindo? Oi, querida. Contigo. Oi. Primeiro, agradecer a palestra, que eu achei muito boa. Oi, tudo bem, Stefano? É... Eu queria fazer uma pergunta. Você falou sobre análise didática, né? você falou assim, sobre a questão do, do, do instituto, de formação. E, assim, pegar um pouquinho isso aí. Primeiro, essa questão né, da análise didática, né? essa diferença... Na, entre o que, que é o didático, o que, que a gente busca na análise, né? quer dizer, aprender a ser analista, mas será que isso não tem em todas as análises, né? de uma certa forma? E queria saber também em questão da política, né? quer dizer, como é que fica a política dentro dos institutos de formação? É, cabe a gente falar dessa política institucional aí? Né? Então, é isso. I'm not sure I entirely understand the question. Uh, you are asking me, what is the training beyond the training? Metaphorically, metapsychically. Ah. É um tanto, né? O que que diferencia, né? A análise didática, que é uma requ... uma requisição do da formação e análise, né? Quer dizer, qual, qual o limite? Como tem? Ah, Onde okay. está esse yes. limite? Very, very easy. Well, I'm not in an institutional position, but I can tell you from my experience. Both are life-changing process if you let yourself be touched by the analysis and the training analysis. Sometimes both the training analysis and the analysis are just a tool. You go to the hour, you say a few dreams, you don't let yourself be touched by that, you know, by what Gigerich calls sublatio, and nothing happens. 
for me, my first analysis was really a, sa a, a savior. My first analysis saved me. I was in a deep depression after my time at Cambridge, lost, lost. And he saved my life and he put me back on track. He accompanied me until I was able to walk with my own legs. Then the training analysis came in 2015 when perhaps my midlife crisis started, I was into a different career. I always wanted to be a psychoanalyst since I was 17, but I repressed that because my inferiority complex made me think I was not good enough. So I had to do other things in my life and maybe even to have a job to earn the money to pay for it. There is no difference between training analysis and analysis. The only difference is that if you want to become a psychoanalyst and work, with people, you have to learn the method. Gigerich is telling this very clearly in his um, uh, one of the last book published last year, that when you are in the room, it's not even about analysis, it's about two human beings talking to each other. But of course, the analyst have to have the theory, the methods, the literature on his backpack. But really, analysis work when it's a conversation between two human beings, a companionment of one of the other, and when you are equal, although you are not technically, but you are equal. You go into analysis if your soul is in pain, if there is an inner pain that needs help. And there is no difference between analysis and training analysis. Mm -hmm. I hope my answer helped you. Sim, não, era isso mesmo. Era essa é a dúvida. Obrigado. Obrigado, Martinha. Muito obrigado. Nadir, pode falar agora, Nadir. Oi, Stefano, boa tarde, boa noite para você. É, primeiro, eu queria te agradecer pela sua fala, foi muito, muito especial. Uh, para mim, pelo menos, foi uma das palestras mais é, significativas desde que eu comecei a participar do Teasos, e eu participo desde o início, o Marcos, acho que sabe, né? acompanho... Uhum. É, assiduamente. A uh, tua fala me tocou muito, eu não sei nem se eu vou conseguir terminar eu de falar a minha aqui, porque eu estou realmente é, bastante emocionada, meu coração está batendo muito forte, desde que você começou a falar, é, mais para o final, na hora que você atingiu um certo ponto, acho que você pegou meu complexo, eu também tenho um complexo materno bastante forte, além de outros. Uh, Bom, enfim, é sobre a questão, a minha formação é em filosofia e eu sinto já há algum tempo um, um certo, vou dizer, vou chamar de preconceito, eu não sei se é esse o nome correto, é, por eu não ter uma formação em psicologia. Eu decidi a minha, esse meu caminho com Jung já um pouco tarde, resolvi fazer uma virada de carreira, porque era o que eu sentia no meu coração, eu estava muito infeliz, até que eu descobri do que, que eu estava precisando. Uh, e o que eu percebo é, eu sigo tudo o que é necessário, eu acredito, é, eu faço supervisão já tem alguns anos, eu faço a minha análise pessoal, eu sou eu estudo bastante porque eu gosto, eu tenho um desejo enorme de me tornar analista, de, é como se eu precisasse, talvez por causa dos meus complexos, de legitimar o meu trabalho. E aqui no Brasil está é, sendo muito difícil conseguir isso. As portas não se abrem para quem não tem uma formação em psicologia, e, além disso, existe é, alguns colegas, há um mês atrás, há umas semanas atrás, não me lembro, surgiu esse assunto e eu cheguei, a, eu me senti é, 
eu me senti muito mal com o resultado da conversa que eu acho que eu mesmo puxei em um determinado ponto. É, o resultado dessa conversa foi que eu um, tive um sonho nessa noite. E no meu sonho, eu estava saindo em fuga de um lugar que estava desmoronando. Uh, e era um lugar que era a, a saída era muito difícil, mas eu encontrei uma saída. E quando eu saí, no meio de um monte de pó, de entulho que estava caindo, o Lacan veio num carro em velocidade alta, freou no lugar onde eu estava e ele falou para mim, vem que eu te dou uma carona. Nesse momento, eu fiquei com muita dúvida do que fazer ali, né? se eu entrava no carro ou se eu saía dali de uma outra forma. O, o sonho parou aí, eu nem entrei no carro e nem segui adiante, eu parou aí o sonho. E, mas no dia seguinte eu decidi o meu caminho, é, e o meu caminho eu acho que é me tornar um Manel Jungiana, eu, eu não fazia ideia do que você ia falar hoje, eu, por isso que eu tô, eu tô, eu tô até tremendo, e eu, eu quero te agradecer muito, muito, mas assim, muito, parece que você me, me colocou num lugar, eu, eu ganhei um lugar com a tua fala, eu estudo Freud já tem bastante tempo, bastante tempo não, há algum tempo, eu não sei quanto é bastante, que eu estudo bastante, porque eu percebi que só com a teoria Jungiana eu não conseguiria atingir um bom trabalho, e aí eu comecei a me interessar por várias outras teorias. E eu tô, tô indo, mas assim o que eu queria te falar é que eu, você me colocou, me deu um lugar e eu, eu não tenho palavras para para agradecer isso, sabe? Você me ajudou muito hoje. E com relação à a, a questão do... Talvez eu pensei, talvez um dia eu tenha que dar um jeito e ir para Zurique, mas eu não, 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 nesse momento eu não tenho recursos para sair do Brasil e ir para Zurique. É um, é, um, é um sonho bacana, mas não, não tenho como. E aí, como é que eu resolvi isso? Ouvi falar nessa mesma conversa, que foi um pouco constrangedora para mim, que Zurique tinha decidido não aceitar mais pessoas de outra formação e que era obrigado a ser psicólogo. E que eu falei, bom, será que isso aconteceu? Porque eu cheguei a baixar, a fazer o download do edital há um ano e meio atrás, dois anos atrás, e eu vi que não era assim. Mas naquele dia ali, eu, eu, eu fiquei, como eu fiquei sensibilizada, eu acabei acreditando que, que provavelmente Zuri que tinha mudado de ideia e que tinha colocado isso como uma regra. Mas, de qualquer forma, eu não tenho como ir para Zuri, que eu não tenho recursos para ir para Zuri. Uh, então, eu resolvi fazer uma pós-graduação em psicologia analítica, é, que não vai legitimar, não vai me dizer que eu sou analista, não vai me dizer que eu sou psicanalista. Uh, então, aí eu falei, bom, seguindo o conselho de uma amiga e depois desse meu sonho com o Lacan, no mesmo dia seguinte, eu me matriculei numa pós-graduação em psicanálise também, onde eu vou receber o título de analista e passei a não me importar mais com o nome Jungiano. Né? Eu sou analista, e ponto. E Neo Jungiana. Incorporo, quero incorporar no meu trabalho tudo que eu acreditar que vai fazer um. que vai me ajudar a compreender os meus, as pessoas que me procuram, os meus pacientes. Bom, então é isso. Acho que eu já falei, a Bessa. Eu, na verdade, Legal, eu queria te, te agradecer profundamente pela tua fala de hoje. Muito obrigada. Thank you. Thank you for your courage. And the day you will go to Zurich, let me know. And we go together to Kuzna, to Jung's and von Franz grave, and you bring a flower and I bring a stone. <laughs> Thank you. Obrigado, Nadia. Hugo, vamos lá, Hugo. 
Hello, Stefano. Uh, good evening. Uh, first of all, I want to... Hugo, in Portuguese, in Portuguese, Hugo, por favor. No, no, uh, pro, pro, prefiro para o pessoal, é mais fácil. Tranquilo. Então, então é português, né? É. Okay. Uh, então, uh, Stefano, né? boa noite. Uh, eu gostaria de uh, te agradecer né, por esse momento, por compartilhar né, essas ideias novas, né? Eu acho muito interessante e eu não tenho muito uma, uma pergunta, né? Eu só queria dizer, sim, né, que, que é muito refrescante essa nova perspectiva e me traz muito essa, essa, esse sentido do símbolo, né? Assim, da, da união, né? Então é como se você estivesse valorizando tanto o passado, né? Tanto o lado clássico quanto o lado atual, né? E até mesmo o futuro, né? Como você bem colocou. Então, é um, é, um, é um trabalho muito interessante e uh, algo que eu não vejo muitos junguianos uh, se proporem a fazer. Né? Então, é, é muito interessante ter, ter essa figura como a sua, assim, que busca unir, né, em vez de fragmentar, em vez de uh, separar. Né? Então, muito obrigado assim, por esse trabalho né, e por esse efeito que você está tá usando aqui né, nessa sala e em nós. Muito obrigado. Obrigado. Thank you. Stefano, vamos, vamos chegando perto do fim, vamos para algo mais biográfico. Não! Gente... Não, então tá bom. A gente tem mais quatro... duas horas, pode ser? Nos conta a história é, do livro e, do, e das entrevistas. Como é que isso apareceu para você? This I want to say also to Nadir. The first interview I, the, the first interview I wanted to do was with Gigerich because I was in uh, supervision with him. And the first very idea, so stupid, was to have a Facebook, five minutes Facebook live, asking Gigerich, who is Jung? And who is your Jung? And what is Jung's relevance in, tw in the 21st century? He looked at me and I said, no, because I could write a, a book about it. I, I don't know if I can, I, I can answer in five minutes. And he was right. So then I approached Ribi in Zurich because Ribi is the most senior, the oldest analyst alive. He's an alchemist. He was in training with von Franz. So I proposed to meet in February 17. And I relate with Nadir and inferiority complex. Because you can see the extroverted Stefano tonight. But also there is the Stefano who feels inferior that doesn't know much about the clinical stuff. And we have to study a lot, much more than the psychologists. And my suggestion is do a very good clinical internship. Take supervisors that are psychiatrists and work on that until you feel confident. But then you will also realize that pathologizing doesn't help much. So Ribi agreed. I took the train from Kusnach to Erlenbach. And I didn't know that Erlenbach, that is the next station from Zurich, has two stops. And obviously, I got out at the wrong one. And I arrived 10 minutes late, sweating, running, <gasps> my inferiority complex. So as soon as he opened the door, I apologized, this big man. I apologized, and he said, come on. Let's have coffee. I can smell your inferiority complex. And, and I thought, he's a fucking genius. He's telling me we are equals. Let's have coffee. We spent two hours talking. Talking two hours before recording. And obviously he said the best bits, not recording about Hillman, about gossip, about sleeping with this, with that. So I know so much gossip now. 
months. It started because I truly believe that we need to record the voice of the singer. And I'm so thankful to those that said yes. It's a pity that only few women said yes. I ask as many women as many men, maybe more women than men. Men are, okay, let's do it. Women had more difficulties, let's say. Yeah. Um, but I'm very happy that many, many women accepted to, do, to be in my anthology. That is a different thing, less personal. So go to my YouTube um, website if you don't want to buy the book, it's fine. And watch the interviews. There are more than 40 interviews now and other talks. It's really to answer one Wagner question before. There are so many different ways to be a union. And it's okay. There are unions like Marcus and I that never met and felt we know each other. And there are unions that may be every day in the training and hate each other. Well, look at that from the shadow point of view. But that's the word. So this book was really in parallel with my training. I graduated last year in February and the book was published in March. So it really was my own self accompaniment throughout the training. And uh, I hope people will enjoy the book for what it is without pretensions, without theory, just a little bit of history of who we are. É, nas entrevistas do vídeo do canal, você entrevistou um colega nosso, Roberto Gambini, um brasileiro. Como foi a sua experiência com ele? Um, I met Roberto in Kuznach at his lectures, and he's such a charismatic person. Plus, he's uh, Italian, or his ancestors were Italian. So I spoke to him, we spoke in Italian, said, listen, I'm doing this, what about doing it? And he said, yes, of course. And we did it. And it was very touching, especially because we recorded the interview in the very room where he discussed his thesis 30 years before, something like that. Um, Stefano, muito obrigado. Obrigado. É, foi um prazer te receber. É, a, gente, a gente podia ficar aqui conversando, abrir a duas ou três garrafas de again. vinho. Let's do it again. The pro, my fee is the same. Vamos falar do próximo livro. Quando o próximo livro estiver nas mãos, a gente traz você de volta aqui. Mas, olha, é, queria te agradecer pela tua disponibilidade, pela simpatia. É, eu sou um admirador, confesso, do seu trabalho. Muito do Tiaços tem a ver com esse livro. Tiaços é um... Você é meu ancestral. <risos> Tiaços é um pouco filho do Breakfast. Então, é uma grande alegria receber você aqui. Obrigado pela tua presença. Cuide-se bem, espero que você fique bem e que a gente possa ter outras oportunidades. Um grande abraço. Thank you so much. You're doing such a great job. I'm not your ancestor, I'm your brother. And you are doing this every every week, almost every week, with amazing people. Amazing people. I mean, thank you. Um grande you abraço, Stefano. See you hopefully next year in Buenos Aires. Com Ciao. certeza. Ciao, bom fim Grazie. de semana. Boa noite, good night. Ciao. Pessoal, obrigado pela presença de mais um Teaços, muito especial com a presença do Stefano. É... Fica o convite, então. Teaços não para, semana que vem tem mais. E agora o Teaços vai fazer uma incursão na Itália. 
As próximas duas palestras são dois analistas italianos, Ricardo Mondo e Luigi Turinese, dois analistas da Escola Arquetípica, colaboradores do Hillman, é, trabalharam com o Hillman, escreveram livros com o Hillman. Então, a gente vai dar um pulinho na Europa, na Itália, e depois a gente volta. Tá bom? Semana que vem, sexta-feira, quatro horas, com o Ricardo Mondo. Obrigado pela presença. Isa, obrigado pela tua disponibilidade hoje. Sei que você está cansada, mas <risos> muito obrigado. Ximenes, beijo. Até a próxima, pessoal. Obrigado. <música>